So our, uh, again, our next program is being presented by Cost Segregation Services. Um, I'm happy to say that CSSI was one of CPA's first preferred partners, and they are now in their fourth year of supporting you and the society. And we greatly, greatly appreciate that. Um, it's been a very valuable partnership for both of us. Um, David and Bonnie will be covering building renovations that require new depreciation strategies. And I believe this is for both commercial and rental properties. So I wanna yeah. welcome David back. Cost segregation um, is now an extremely valuable tool to generate cash flow for com commercial building owners um, in 2023. For the past 10 years, David has spoken around the country on accelerating depreciation strategies for commercial building owners and trained thousands of tax and real estate professionals in understanding the cash flow benefits of cost segregation. David is a graduate of LSU in mechanical engineering and continues to cheer for the Tigers. Sorry to hear that. Um, in Baton Rouge, no, I get it. You got to go. We're going to win the Heisman. Got to go with your home team. Um, Bonnie Griffin Cake is our local CSSI rep here. Bonnie and I have worked together again, I said, for the last four years. She's an awesome uh, resource. Happy to answer your questions. Whether you're going to use CSSI or not, she is always happy and willing to answer your questions. So I encourage you to follow up with her um, if you have any questions about uh, cost seg and depreciation, all those kind of things. Um, and with that, I roll it over to you two. Uh, thank you, Daryl. I'm going to open up with this uh, comment from uh, Jack Welsh. The operative assumption today is that someone somewhere has a better idea, and the operative compulsion is to find that idea, learn it, and put it into action fast. So we have just a little bit of time where we don't want to slog through the regulations, but we want to go over common scenarios, common depreciation scenarios that you have to deal with every year for your clients that own commercial buildings. So I want to throw up some of those common scenarios. We'll talk about it, what we recommend and how to stack uh, depreciation deduction on depreciation deduction to hopefully make you a tax hero for your clients. So the great thing about better ideas that I started with is they're cumulative. You know, Daryl, if I give you a dollar and you give me a dollar, we each have one dollar. But if I give you an idea and you give me an idea, we each have two ideas. That's the good part about ideas. The bad part about ideas is what you already know prohibits you from learning new things. So for some people, I'm going to have to kind of try and reprogram your brain to be able to understand that there's some new strategies that you should be employing for your clients, not just defaulting to the old strategies that you may be using. Again, so let me prove that. I said that, uh, that what you already know prohibits you from learning new things. On the next slide, I'm going to show you seven little words that any third grader in the Louisiana school system can understand. So let me show you that. I'm going to show it to you and I'm going to ask you what it says. So here we go. All right, so my question to the audience is what did you see? You probably said, I love Paris in the springtime, didn't you? Like 99% of you are going to say that. I love Paris in the springtime. That's six words. I said seven little words that any third grader in Louisiana's public school system can understand. Let me show you what happened. Your eyes saw it. Your subconscious brain says, I've been taught since the third grade. That makes no sense. It edited to your conscious brain and you said, I love Paris in the springtime. But let me show you what it actually says. It says, I love Paris in the, the springtime. We've known since third grade. That doesn't make sense. So our brains edited that. So I say all that to say, I'm going to show you some new concepts. They're not really new concepts, but how to stack them together, how, how to utilize these so that we can help your clients through these inflationary times. We can help your clients through times where the cost of money is really expensive. So if you can get them an interest-free loan from the government by simply employing the right depreciation strategy, why wouldn't you? So Bonnie and I, Bonnie, uh, we're going to show you a couple scenarios. Uh, you probably had this, you know, your client comes to you with an invoice. We just redid the parking lot. What do I do with this? Can, can I write this off or do I have to expense this? Or we, we changed out one of six uh, or one of four uh, HVAC units. Uh, we, we changed the roof. Hey, I bought, a, I bought some apartments and we're going to redo those. You know, what can I write off? What do I have to depreciate? Uh, what's the depreciation schedule? Hey, I bought an office building. You know, um, what I do there are, you know, your, your people that own um, commercial properties, uh, retail spaces, you know, it's getting hard to rent some 
times. It's tough in retail. So what are some strategies where they can maybe do the renovations, pay for those, and then expense the We'll talk about what do you do when you uh, throw stuff away to make sure you're capturing that and LED retrofit. So what I'm about to go into very briefly, very high level, is how do we take all of these regulations and blend those regulations together to come up with a, a tax strategy for each of those situations? And if I can just make you aware of these, you don't have to learn all these today. You just need to remember Bonnie's phone number. That's all you need in your phone depreciation specialist and put her phone number there so that when when you have these questions a year, two, three from now, she'll be able, you'll be able to call her and make you look like a tax hero to, to your clients because you've saved them all of this. Now, what I'm showing you today is not anything that's risky. It's not, uh, you know, um, tax loopholes. These are just the regulations, tax cut and job set, cost segregation, tangible property regulations. These are all the regulations that have put in place over the last 10 years. And we just want to learn how to fully utilize them. So we're talking about tax reform, right? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I'm i sure a lot of people listening here have uh, seen online uh, called tax loopholes. Um, I have a problem with that term because it's not really a loophole. It's a exactly. legal strategy. And it's encouraged by the American Society of CPAs. It's encouraged by the Journal of Accountancy. It's not a loophole. It is a regulation, a legal way of depreciating taxes. That's right. All, all of these strategies are uh, uh, legal uh, strategies. So, so for instance, so your client's going to come to you and say, hey, we just had the parking lot uh, redone. We, we put in a new layer of asphalt in there. What do we do with this? You know, over the years that we've owned this building, it's gotten worse and worse. We're starting to lose uh, cars into the potholes. So we decided to finally fix it. What do we do with that? Okay. What's your recommendation? What do you say to your client? Well, you say to your client, oh, that's 39 year property. Well, you know, you're a dinosaur if you're saying it's 39 year property. There's a lot better ways to classify that. You could say it's 15 year in property. It's a land improvement and it is, and that's good. So we can depreciate that over 15 years, right? Okay. But understand that 15 year property is now eligible for bonus depreciation. Ah, so in 2023, we can take 80% of that expenditure in the first year and be able to write that off and be able to uh, uh, capitalize that and then depreciate that uh, 80% in the first year and the rest will depreciate over 15 years. Okay, if you think you're pretty good, you know, why don't we do something even better than that? Why don't we determine whether we can expense it as a uh, repair versus an improvement? Use the tangible property regulations to say, you know, uh, you spent this money, it's probably less than 35% of what you originally spent on the parking lot or what it would cost to put a new parking lot in. So therefore, if it's less than 35%, I can, by the tangible property regs examples, be able to say, that doesn't rise to the level of an improvement. That's a repair. And I can go ahead and expense that repair. I'm going to write that off, all of it off. Well, you can, you know, I can write 80% of it off and, and depreciate it. Why, what's the big deal about writing it all off as a repair and expensing it? There's no recapture on that. So it's expensed and therefore there's no recapture. So when there's a time to sell the building, there's no recapture uh, like you would have to do if it were a 15 year property. So David, yes. what about, tell them a little bit about what if they bought the property, did a cost segregation on the before uh, fault, areas and then a year or two later they did the uh overlay on that how would you sure. handle that yeah so so if they've if they've bought the building and you can do a cost segregation study on it that would certainly be the the best thing to uh, identify the value of the 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 property as 15 year property and then uh when you do the renovations you've got a cost segregation report that shows what's the value of that uh, parking lot. And then you can easily compare the uh, expense, um, the invoice that you have to show that that's less than 35%, which is a rule of thumb that's not in the regs, but we'll we'll explain a little bit of that. So, so yes, anytime you have a cost segregation study, it's going to make things a lot easier. For instance, uh, your, your client's uh, HVAC rooftops uh, units. 
So let's say they have four of them and they come to you with a $25,000 invoice and say, hey, one of them went out. We went ahead and replaced it. What do I do with this invoice? Okay, spent $25,000. What's, what's, your, what's your response? Uh, 39 years for HVAC equipment. That's what the depreciable life is typically on structural property. Yeah, not, not so good. Uh, how about if you section 179 it so that you can write it off um, uh, and dispose of the old and keep the new. So you take a disposition of the old and be able to write off the partial asset disposition, whatever remaining balance is in there. And then you uh, put the section uh, under section 179, you put that item on the depreciation schedule, and then you can uh, depreciate that 100% in the first year. That's pretty good. Uh, may not be the best way, though, because if you utilize the tangible property regulations again, you could make the determination that says, hey, I have four of those you, uh, rooftop units, and I only repaired one of them or got rid of one of them that's only 25 percent in the regulations it typically says if you're spending less than 35 to 40 percent of the unit of property if that invoice is less than 25 to 35 percent of the unit of property that doesn't rise to the level of improvement therefore you can expense it so that's the best scenario there is to expense it. If you had a cost segregation report, you would have a number for those rooftop units to where you can easily compare that invoice and says it doesn't rise to the level of an improvement. So again, tangible property regulations win again. So you can see you've got a lot of choices here and depending on which one you choose to use, you know, it, uh, whether it's uh, how it uh, benefits your client, it's up to you. Uh, but a lot of people aren't aware on utilizing the tangible property regulations. Uh, what if you have to, uh, I won't go into this very much, but but it'll be in the slide. So what if you have to uh, capitalize the unit and you've replaced a unit, put in a new one, how do you know how much to write off of that old unit? When you remove that, you must take that off the depreciation schedule. So what do I write off? What is, what is the value of that? So uh, because it's not broken out, you might not have a cost segregation. Uh, so, you know, there is a way to use, you don't necessarily need a cost segregation study. You can use the producer price in, index to determine, you know, take the new invoice, use the producer price index to go back to the year that the old one was put in service. Now depreciate that forward to the current year. And that tells you the remaining depreciable balance that you have in that unit. So, Nathan, yes, we have a question here. Uh, June is asking if you choose to depreciate the parking lot improvement over 15 years, instead of expensing it as a repair, do you now retire the original parking lot cost from depreciation or continue to depreciate it and depreciate the re-asphalt? So that's a, that's a great question on, on that one. Since, since it's probably, um, it, you're gonna call that a, a, a separate unit of property. And, and depreciate both the old one and the new one. Now, if you were, uh, if you're replacing the item, completely replacing it, you would utilize the value typically of the new one and take the old one off of the depreciation schedule. But a repair is not going to, not going to rise to the level of that parking lot more than likely. So that's what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. If, if it is a, uh, if it's a complete redo where you dig up the old one, and put in a new one, yes, you would write off the old one, the remaining depreciable value of the old one, and then put in, uh, utilize the uh, depreciable value of the new one. So you're right, Jim, you always have to have at least one item on the depreciation schedule. It's just depending on the facts and circumstances, which one do you keep? But wouldn't you, if, if the overlay is a repair, wouldn't that be expensed? Yes, it's uh, typically what you would use is the, uh, uh, you can call that a repair. It's, it's just a small fraction of the cost of the, um, of the parking lot, typ typically. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yes, you would, uh, you would expense that. It wouldn't go onto the depreciation schedule. You're correct. And Kenneth is asking a question here. He says, even though no recapture, do you still have ordinary income to recognize? 
Do you still have ordinary income to recognize? I'm, I'm not sure of the question. Um, because you, you're expensing it. Um, so you don't have depreciation on it. Right. So you wouldn't have recapture if you're expensing something. Uh, that's that's right. So there's there's no recapture on on the expensing of of that item. I, I tell you what, uh, if you would email me the question, it uh, I'll take a little more time to uh, research it and and get you the proper answer on on, on that if if I could. Okay. So so here's so understanding tangible property regulations. You know, boiling, you know, hours and hours and hours of videos that you would have to watch to become an expert on. Uh, on tangible property regulations. Here's the simple puts versus keeps analogy. So uh, capital expenditure generally puts uh, permanent increment into the longevity. Uh, so therefore it must be capitalized. A repair is something that keeps the building structure or the unit that's operating, keeps it in ordinary and efficient operating condition. So the difference between puts in service and keeps in service is the difference between uh, an improvement and a repair. It's the difference between capitalizing and um, uh, having to um, a, a expense that or being able to expense that. So, okay. So more than likely, uh, again, common scenario, client comes to you with a, a roof. Hey, we put on a new membrane roof or we put in uh, new shingles on that. So what is it that we should do with this, um, you know, with this item, typically roofs are 39 years, right? Uh, under section 179, um, you can, um, uh, under section 179, you can, um, uh, be able to, uh, expense that, uh, roof. Uh, because the new regulations on Section 179 uh, say that you're a able to do that. So you can look at, uh, you know, it's your choice, 39 years or 27 and a half years is if it's uh, residential. Uh, Section 179, it, which are better than that, you can apply the repair versus improvement test. In the regulations, it shows an example that says if you spent less than 40% on the membranes or the shingles in comparison to the unit of property, what's the unit of property for the roof? Well, that's all of the uh, membranes, shingles, but the underlayment, the decking, the rafters, the uh, truss supports, if you're spending less than 40% than that number, then you can call that a repair. Well, the majority of times, uh, replacing the shingles or replacing the membrane, you're certainly going to be less than that 40%. So by understanding, uh, and so that's kind of, uh, you know, these regulations aren't in writing that says you can do that, but the industry has adopted these repair uh, examples in the tangible property regulations as a rule of thumb to be able to use to determine does that expenditure rise to the level of improvement or even though it meets the definition of a level of improvement, it might not rise to level of improvement. Therefore it's a repair. We um, might, might want to point out that, that a roof is different than um, repairs on other items that the roof has a 40%. Uh, you know, if it's under 40% of a total replacement, you can uh, take that and uh, mark it as an expense. Whereas if um, if it's some other item, um, you know, replacing something else in the building or outside, then we're looking at 35%, not 40. Yeah, typically in the examples, it, there's a trend line that they intentionally put into the regulations that says one out of three. So about 33%. So one out of three, if you're replacing one out of three, you're okay. If you're replacing more than that, more than likely it rises to the level of improvement and uh, has to be capitalized. But there is a specific example on a roof where they utilize the 40% the number. Okay, um, let's let's keep going here so we can make our deadline for Daryl. I'm not going over my time, Daryl. I'm not, I promise you. 
Uh, I'll uh, let you know when it's when it's a quarter after. Now I'm I'm, I'm going to give it to you, hand this off to you, so you can cover uh, your section pretty quick, Bonnie. So okay. again, uh, uh, apartment upgrades. You know, what do you do with those? Is it just a refresh, or, or is it a major renovation? Uh, you know, what's coming out of those? So, uh, what you want to do is if. So and doing major renovations, taking a lot of stuff out. You want to capture the value of what's being removed. What's the depreciable basis that's remaining in those cabinets, in the that carpeting that they're taking out? You want a good quality cost seg firm to evaluate before they start ripping out, you know, what's the value of that? So that as it's taken out in that year, you can write that off. And then whatever's going in, you do can do a cost segregation study on what is going in and accelerate depreciation on that and be able to write the majority of that off in the first year. So for your apartment owners, there's lots of, um, there are lots of regulations that will assist them in any renovations that they are, are, are doing. So again, having a good cost segregation depreciation specialist to help you with that, you know, will be uh, very, um, very helpful. And again, Bonus depreciation applies. We'll talk about bonus depreciation, but items that are less than 20 year depreciable life, typically personal property, five years, everything that's going into the, um, into the uh, apartment complex uh, or 15 year property, what's out in the parking lot, uh, landscaping and so forth. All of those items are eligible for bonus depreciation in the first year. In addition to that, for commercial property, um, you know, there's also a, another a deduction that you need to be aware of. So if they're doing a major renovation where they're uh, taking a lot out, again, partial asset disposition, you want to value what's being removed and be able to write that off. You want to cost seg all the five-year personal property that's going back into that. So that's carpet, cabinets, crown molding, um, ceiling fans, all of those items are qualified for a five-year property, and you can ut utilize bonus depreciation with that. Also, the other qualified improvement property or real property that you're putting in, if you haven't changed the footprint and it's just on the inside, non-residential property, non-structural, you can write those off, excuse me, you can assign a 15-year depreciable life to those under qualified improvement property. 15 year life, less than 20, therefore they're eligible for bonus depreciation. So this is a huge, huge number for your uh, clients that have a commercial space where they don't, they can't get a loan to go out and buy a new building. So they're choosing to stay where they're at and just renovate. Practically everything that they're spending on the inside of that building is now eligible for bonus depreciation in the first year. So having a good cost segregation specialist to help you with all those um, all those renovations will be worth its weight in gold and earn you that tax hero status. So start getting measured for that red cape because you'll have tax hero status in your clients, in your client size. So again, uh, these are all, um, deductions that, uh, you know, are qualified for here. Here's something on the qualified improvement property. If you had a client that did some renovations in 2018, 2019, 2020, you might've picked up a client where another CPA, uh, you know, they had these renovations back then and they, uh, back then, 2018, 2019, there was a glitch in the language that's been now fixed. But back then, everything that was built on the inside was 39 properties. So the qualified improvement property was 39 property, wasn't eligible for bonus depreciation. That was changed in 2020. So go back, look at those, and you can go back and change that to a qualified improvement property definition that's 15 year property. Therefore, it's eligible for 100% bonus depreciation when it went in back in 2018, 2019, 2020. So you can go back with simply using a 3115, no need to amend, but just use a 3115 designated change number seven, and you can go back and reverse that. So again, a cost segregation company will be able to help you with that. So again, that was under the CARES Act. Uh, and, um, you know, that's, that's worth its weight in gold in the right situation. All right, here's, here's, here's a couple more. Uh, retail space, we talked about this. Your client has retail space. What uh, is gonna do some renovation on it? What should he be looking for? Well, again, if he paid, 
if he has a client that moves out and he had paid for those leasehold improvements, if they're ripping it out and changing that over for the next client, you want to be able to write off one into the dumpster. If he had paid for that, whatever's going in, if he's paying for that, you would want to use a cost segregation study. Oh, might be qualified improvement property that he's, he's putting in. So therefore, uh, those items that are not personal property, but, uh, um, structural property or real property might be eligible for qualified improvement property. Could he utilize section 179, uh, for those items? He could, if he's a real estate professional, um, or, or, or here's, here's the home run. Let's say, you know, he's going to renovate one of those six spots. One out of six is less than that 35% that we've been talking about. So he really could be able to pay for the leasehold improvements and call that a repair to the building and therefore expense that. That's again, when you start earning tax hero status, when you're able to do that for your clients. So again, these are all strategies that you need to be made aware of, um, you know, and, and one more for you, LED retrofits. A lot of our clients are, you know, trying to upgrade the energy efficiency of their buildings. So what happens when you remove that old light fixture? Well, there's still depreciable basis in there. So let's write off what's being removed and the partial asset disposition. You can write off the labor to remove that. Okay. Now you're putting that a new fixture back in uh, for that. And there's labor to put that back in that could qualify uh, for um, qualified improvement property uh, and be eligible for bonus depreciation. So for a LED retrofit, you know, you're able to write off a substantial amount of the project and help your client pay for that. Again, Can we go back uh, yep. par with the partial asset disposition. You've got that here. Um, so with partial asset disposition on that retail center, one of the things that I think uh, uh, sometimes CPAs miss is that they bought the building as it is. When that tenant vacates, if if they didn't have a tenant in there, or if the tenant that was in there vacates, you can use partial asset disposition on that because the owner of that property purchased the property with that tenant improvement in there already. So he's paid for it as long as the tenant didn't pay for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Uh, that's uh, Bonnie. Bonnie, that's a good point. So, so keeping going here, Bonnie, I'm going to turn this over to you, but you can see how you stacking depreciation strategy on top of depreciation strategy on top of a base of cost segregation really makes this, uh, these deductions quite a huge sum of money for the right clients. Uh, but it's essentially an interest free loan from the government. So Bonnie, you know, everything that I've been talking to the cares act, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, they all sit on a base of uh, cost segregation. And so let's let's talk about a little bit about uh, cost segregation. If you can kind of lead us through some of that discussion. Sure. Um, I'd like to read a couple of questions here that came in as well. Um, Mike says, do you have a general rule of thumb for when the benefits exceed the cost and time value of money for new or existing buildings, commercial, apartments, et cetera? Uh, great, great question. So we've even been able to make cost segregation studies uh, cost effective on buildings of $200,000 and, and, and above. I have done a few below that, but if we can make it cost effective on a $200,000 building, uh, we can certainly make it effective on, you know, a $300,000 building, $400,000 million and, and on up. So with the, uh, with the cost segregation pricing that's in the market today, it really pays to look at just about every building that you have, as well as those buildings that have not employed uh, an accelerated depreciation strategy. They're still utilizing straight line depreciation to go back and look at buildings that you a client may have owned for five, 10 years, and to change that method of accounting to a accelerated depreciation strategy. And those buildings work as well. So we'll talk about how to do that as well. Yeah, and, and most of the time, even on the uh, smaller buildings, uh, unless the particular client is in a very, very low tax bracket, 
there's an advantage to be had there. Um, so our estimates are free as uh, most cost seg firms are. Um, just get the estimate and then take a look at it and see how it fits your particular tax situation. We don't hard pressure sell and no arm twisting here, but you have, once you have the information, it's very valuable for you for the upcoming uh, tax season. And we can go through these on a very uh, specific level for your situation. Um, some, uh, somebody else here, Pete's asking, is there any length of time you have to own the building before you can use the qualified improvement category, QIP? That, that's a great question. So the building has to be in commercial service before you start the renovations. So that can be during your ownership or it can be in a previous ownership. So if someone else had the building in commercial service and you buy that building and start renovations immediately before you put it in service, that prior uh, life where it was in service counts. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to be in service on your watch. Uh, we talk about this, uh, Bonnie and I, we're talking about this for short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone can buy a short-term rental that has previously been a short-term rental and do their renovations to that, then they can apply qualified improvement property. If they're buying a long-term rental where it was just a, a rental home, it's never been in commercial service, they could buy that, put it in service for a month or so, something that shows that it was in service, and then do take it out of service, do the renovations. So the regulations say it has to be in service at least one day before uh, the improvements start, but uh, certainly you would want it more than one day on short-term rentals. But uh, that's a, gr a huge strategy for short-term rentals, but great, great question. So if it's been in previous service, that counts. Or if you've had it in service some, for some period of time, as low as one day, that would count as well. And, and we might also mention that uh, a qualified improvement property on a short-term rental can work if the average length of stay is seven days or less. If it's more than seven days, but less than 30, qualified improvement property can't be applied. But you're still using a 39 year depreciation on those because um, it's considered a, a short term rental and all short term rentals less than 30 days have to be on a 39 year depreciation schedule. And we see probably, hate to say it, the majority of them I see are being done wrong at the tax professional level. They're showing them at 27 and a half. So I would suggest you don't raise a red flag for the IRS because they're looking for ways to get those new guys busy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's... All so... right. So, so, so we're talking about parts and pieces here um, uh, for, uh, cost segregation, Bonnie, you know, you, yeah. they can look at the building as a whole and depreciate it over straight line over 39, 27 and a half, or they can look at the parts and pieces uh, where, you know, $2 million building, you know, maybe a hundred thousand dollars of cash flow would be available to your client if you switch them to a cost segregation model. Well, and we also want to mention that, um, you know, just because it's 2023, and uh, the uh, uh, bonus is down to 80% now. Um, if they bought that building back in 22, 2018, you still have 100% depreciation, a bonus depreciation on. And I think a lot of people think, well, gee, it's only 80%. It's not 80% if you bought the building before that. So you have a lot of clients out there that you can look like the hero if you realize this, get an estimate for them and then say, look, do you want this extra money? Okay. So um, using an analogy for cost segregation, because there may be new CPAs on here that um, haven't seen that before um, or are not familiar with cost segregation. So let's make it really simple. Okay. Let's compare it to a Big Mac. Okay. The hamburger is like a straight line method. $5.39, okay? So you divide it by whatever the 27 and a half or 39 years, and you get that little bit, few pennies here and there every year, okay? But looking at it from a, uh, look at the cost segregation method, 
view of it. Go ahead, David, put them up. I, I wonder if Daryl's old enough to remember this. So people over 50, you know, the little jingles playing in their head. So it's it's two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on sesame seed bun, right? And yeah. so, uh, you know, I, I, I use this analogy. There's usually some older people in the crowd, but we went back and we found the jingle. So let me let me see if I can play this to where you can hear this. McDonald's Big Mac, the great big sandwich with a great big taste. Yeah, so that's that's like a 50 year commercial, but with you know, us older people are all have that in our head. And and Bonnie, uh, I, I was talking to one of our co workers and I showed him this picture, and they were a younger person. They go, What's that thing right there? What's 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 that thing with the numbers on it? It's like, well, that's how you change the channel back uh, back in the day before they had buttons on the remote. But anyway, if so, so if you've never felt the uh, the the change of the channel there, or or someone says, hey, you know, turn the channel, that's what they were referring to. Dad always made the kid get up and go turn the channel. But anyway, uh, if if you know what that button is, you're officially old. Welcome to the club. So making cost segregation easy, we'll use the bucket analogy here. If you think about your base building as 39 or 27 and a half year depreciation, that's what a straight line is. They just divide it by, you know, the total purchase of the building minus land divided by 39 or 27 and a half. And you get your depreciation dribbled to you over the years. But what we're doing with cost segregation is we're dividing out the base building itself. And that's 1250 property, which is structural. And then anything that is between five and 15 year depreciation, um, we can take that up front. If it was between 2000, October of 2017 and December of 2022, we're looking at 100%. You're looking at this year, you know, purchase this year and occupancy this year, then we're down to 80%. So don't overlook the advantage of this for your clients. Even an estimate is helpful for them. David, can you move it? Okay. So what comes under these categories? The structure of the building is right here. All of these items here. And the five-year, typically moldings, carpeting, cabinets, special plumbing, or specialty electrical. A lot of buildings are putting in specialty electrical. And even RV parks are putting in specialty electrical. And they may not qualify for a general depreciation because everything is under 20 years. But if we do a cost seg study on this, it includes tangible property. All of that specialty electrical for an RV park also fits into this. And there are a lot of money that's being left on the table. Um, QIP, the other, you know, all of this um, is available for you to leverage. Uh, this is what um, we have the input document for your client's return. And it shows a breakout of all the building components which are five year, the 15 year, and we give you all the structural breakout. It's not just one number. And this comes in very handy in the years coming up because you know what you're dealing with. If they have to replace one of these, then you can use the next slide. We'll show you how we break that out for building systems. These are the building systems that are normally, you know, the capitalized items that go on for 27 and a half or 39 years. So you have not only the depreciable cost, you have the replacement cost right here. So what does that mean? If you're doing replacing the roof, which is a, uh, you know, usually a capitalized item and you're doing what we consider, um, you know, a repair, um, which is a lot of what have been capitalized in the past. Um, if it's under 40% of the replacement cost, not the depreciable cost, but the replacement cost. You as a CPA have that number available to you and you can say, okay, if what we're doing is less than 40% on the roofing of this replacement cost, what do you do with it? You expense that, okay? So that's something that really takes a good look back at that because when you get that cost say, it's actually making your job easier and you become the hero. 
So cash flow strategies, uh, we are, okay, we're, we are at 315, David, so we don't have much time left. Maybe, I think it's 10 minutes yet, okay? So um, this is the sequence for new and improved properties, but let's, let's pick a couple slides here. This one, I, well, let's go back to that one. I like that slide. This shows you, and it says 100% first year. That's that's for things between October 2017 and December of 2022. It'd be 100%. Um, of course, it's going to be a little bit less than this, um, you know, for 80%. But you'll see here that the blue line here is your standard straight line depreciation. So what we're doing is we're pulling a little money out of the future years, which you would have for depreciation, and pouring that into the first year, um, 80% now, 100% in purchases during that that former time. Um, and um, uh, so it just drags us out a little bit, but you get the idea here. This is accelerating the depreciation. So you have that cash flow now. And that's what you need because, you know, your client is expecting you to come up with strategies more and more. You're not just shoveling papers and transferring numbers from their records to the IRS. So this is the type of strategy that makes you the hero. But all of this is based upon the foundation of cost segregation as to whether you can then go to the CARES Act, the tangible, pro or excuse me, TCJA, <coughs> excuse me, or the uh, tangible property regulations. Okay, and um, okay, so what we're doing is we are delivering results for you and your client. So the first thing you get is a no cost review. No cost to you at all or your client. Um, just you know, answer a few questions and we can get you an estimate within one to three days. I mean, if you do a 1031 exchange on these things, it might take three days for us to get back to you, but we can do that. Okay. Site survey, we get those in place. <coughs> we do on-site, inside, and outside surveys. Physical appear physically there. And we do that because we don't want to miss anything. And we don't want anything to have the IRS come back and say, well, gee, was this really a tile floor? Or was this really a wooden floor or vinyl? And you're, we categorize them according to what those are. So we want documentation. And that means photos as well. But we're doing that inside the property, not externally or with some drone. Uh, the analyst, uh, the analysis itself, uh, once you've committed to the uh, uh, the prediction, you know, the, the estimate that we give you, we're looking at four to six weeks now. Uh, we brought that in in the last year to make it even, you know, even shorter time. We deliver the results. And if you need a 3115, I know personally, I include those, <coughs> excuse me, for my clients, because I know that they are a real pain in the backside for CPAs. So you can get those included in a cost segregation estimate from when I do them for you. Ex these are several examples um, of how we, you know, in increase the tax savings for each client in, in any of these. Self-storage is a lot more than you might think. <laughs> dental office. Okay, I'm watching the time here. Okay, dental office, let's go on, uh, uh, David, so we can get to the uh, uh, the grouping stuff here too. It's uh... if, if there's any questions on here, please let me know. Okay, nothing right now. Okay, all right. So okay. partial asset disposition. We had talked about that before. Um, I want to mention one thing about partial asset disposition. A good place for that are uh, uh, franchise restaurants. Uh, automobile deal, de automobile dealerships, where they're required by their corporate office to upgrade the look of the place, there can be a significant benefit there by using the partial asset disposition. And we can do studies strictly on the partial asset disposition to give them that benefit there as well. So be the hero, okay? So grouping activities. This is one that is commonly missed. And sadly, if it's not caught in the first year when the the dentist or the, the you know, the vet clinic, whatever it is that owns this building, um, if it, it's missed in the first year, it's gone. So you want to group these things up front 
but Dennis owns the building and his building or owns the building and the practice. He can split those. A lot of times they do. Okay. One is the, the realty that holds the property. The other is his practice itself. Here we have clean teeth LLC. The LLC is the business operation and the building is on the right hand side, as you can see it here with the, the dental building. Now, if you miss this, it's gone. So you want to group the dental practice with the building in the first year. And, and there are some um, regulations that govern this. The, the ownership entity of the dental practice and the building have to be basically the same. And they don't have to have the same business name like LL, the Clean Teeth LLC or Clean Teeth or, or the, the uh, business operation itself. And we can go into that more if you want more information on it, okay? So uh, by grouping it, it does, in the first year is what you want to do with any of these practices that buy their own building. So cash flow strategies, think of it this way. What, what if, you know, a client of yours buys a million dollar building and um, the basis is a is million dollars. In other words, it's free of land. You're probably looking at thirty dollars to $80,000 in taxes he does not have to pay. That's after tax cash flow. Okay, comes into him thirty to eighty thousand. Okay. Usually, it's between ten percent and twenty five percent. I've seen some even more uh, of the basis itself, the depreciable basis. But Bonnie, my client has owned this, and I don't want to file an amended return because I'm going to get all this extra scrutiny. Uh, do I have to file an amended return to go back and uh, change to a cost segregation method? No, that's a, a, a common methodology. Um, a lot of times they'll go back and try, you know, a CPA or a tax professional will go back and say, well, let's amend the taxes. Um, doing that is a trigger for the IRS because they know if there's an amended return, something's changed and they want to make sure that they know what changed. So um, you're better off doing a cost segregation and doing a, a form 3115 which is the application for change in accounting method. And we can do those for you and uh, we can do them in, in several different ways. We can create it, you can review it and sign it, send it in, or we can have our internal CPA uh, sign it for you. It's, it's your choice. You have to just let us know which way you wanna do it. Most of my clients want us to do it, send it to them, they'll review it and sign it and send it off. But the 3115 looked like that. Okay. Uh so, so, so to wrap up here, you know, I, I hope we've showed you some better ideas on depreciation strategies, you know, for properties that are being retrofitted. Um, you know, there's lots of options for you, the tax professional to identify them properly and be able to, to accelerate depreciation or even expense the items. So by having that depreciation specialist in your phone, don't forget to put Bonnie's number in, in your phone. So that way, when you need someone to help you make all these decisions, we're, we're, we're certainly there. So if, if you need us to run some analysis for you uh, to see if cost segregation is a better idea for you and your clients, you know, we're with just the uh, building basis, date, place and service type building, cost of the renovation, we can go ahead and run the numbers for you. So you and your client can make a secure financial decision to say, hey, this truly is a better idea. So again, thank you so much. I hope we've been able to share some ideas that will make you a tax hero in your client's eyes. And don't forget to uh, reach out to Bonnie uh, with any questions that you have. Uh, and so let's let's take a few questions uh, if we have to. We got one minute left, Daryl. I made it. You better, you, I can't see you answering a question in a minute, David, but you can try. <laughs> <laughs> there is one here, David. We got yep. one here. It says, um, Karen says, is using cost seg by expensing items versus depreciating them provide a permanent tax savings or is it a temporary saving? So, so, you know, what you're, what you're creating with a cost segregation study is you're creating an interest free loan from the government. Let's, let's be honest. There's recapture on that loan. That's why it's a loan, right? So they're paying an upfront cost to get that loan essentially to do the, the paperwork, to be able to get the depreciation deductions that they can then apply, but they can keep that cash as long as they own the building, put it to use for themselves. So that's the 
the cheapest money that you can find out there right now is to do a cost segregation study or a look back study for your clients to be able to, um, you know, find them the cash that they need because the cost of money is so expensive. So, yeah. And I want to just, just mention here, cause I, I love this particular quote by Guy Kawasaki and he says, um, you know, what's the number one, um, word in, in the world of business and that's cash flow. The number two is leverage. And that's what cost segregation gives you and your client is leverage. Uh, we have a bonus for everyone here. If you'll download our presentation, there's a whole section on short-term rentals. Uh, we knew that we couldn't get to that, but we wanted you to have that information as well. So, uh, you know, past these slides, there's about 30 slides on short-term rentals. So uh, please uh, download the uh, information. Uh, and again, um, I can't thank you enough, Daryl, for uh, hosting us. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be a, uh, uh, a silver partner o over these years. So thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, David and Bonnie, as always, full, chock full of information. Um, and you can tell that by all the questions. So sorry, everyone, didn't get them all answered. Please reach out to Bonnie. I threw that link up there. Um, you'll get her information in the email tomorrow as well. And she's ha happy to uh, answer some of those questions that we didn't get to. And we'll see you again in five minutes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.